we can all get into sort of feeling, you know, sorry for ourselves or having a pity party about the past or what's happened. It's just not worth it because it affects the present and it affects the future. But you're supposed to do that. You're supposed to shove the boundaries and you're supposed to do stuff that's out there. And you're supposed to do stuff that makes people uncomfortable, maybe. I remember before they had all these monitors so you could look at all the different cameras, I was on a four-wheeler in a kilt with long hair just like <laughs> going around and looking at all the cameras and saying, that's a good shot. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. What's up at seven? My one word is believe and I believe in you. I believe you have an amazing gift inside you that I want to see explode out onto the world. So let's get your motivation to a 10 and get you believing in you. Grab a snack and chew on today's lessons from a man who went from being the six of 11 children growing up in Australia and sharing a $30 per week apartment to becoming an award-winning actor and being worth almost half a billion dollars He's Mel Gibson, and here's my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy! All right, let's kick things off with rule number one, be a sponge. I soaked everything up like a sponge. Are you kidding? With he and Peter Weir and, and, and other directors that I worked with, I just I was just drinking it up. Mm -hmm. Because I found it e extremely interesting. So I was I, I didn't go to my trailer. I would hang out on the set and ask people questions. I would talk to the camera guys, the lighting guys, the sound guys. Mm -hmm. I was talking to the director. I would say, why are you doing that? What's the significance of that lens? What's it doing? You know, and it was uh, um, and I was just and, and they were very generous. This was my school. Mm. And I was right at the hub of it, you know, and I could jump in front of the camera and then go back behind and look at it again. So it was a, it was a heck of an education. And I wasn't, I was on the set, you know, not, so not in a trailer someplace. Yeah. Rule number two is just start swimming. There's like 3,000 people on the set. You got nine cameras. There's a lot to do. There's a lot of people to feed. There's people complaining. Uh, everybody has to be in the right place at the right time to get the shot. I mean, logistically speaking, you need a pretty good team of people around you to deal with that stuff. And you need a lot of energy. I remember before they had all these monitors so you could look at all the different cameras, I was on a four-wheeler in a kilt with long hair just like <laughs> going around and looking at all the cameras and saying, that's a good shot. Can you like do this with the frame or put another lens on or whatever it happened to be? And... Um, you just, look, I find it's so overwhelming sometimes. If you, if you think about the big picture, you'd crawl back into a hole and die. Mm. So what you have to do and when you're dropped in the middle of the ocean, an ocean of a sea of troubles and people and logistical problems and cameras and infighting and the producers, are, you know, there's, there's so much stuff going on behind the scene. You have to ignore it. Say you're in the middle of the ocean and just start swimming that way. Stroke at a time, and you'll hit land eventually. So that's all there is to it. You haven't really got time once you're amongst it to actually be fearful or too worried because you're just too damn busy. How many decisions do you get asked in, a sing in an hour, right, when you're, when you're in the chair? How many questions, how many decisions do you have to make? And I mean, like that. And you gotta do it fast. Rule number three, don't get stuck. It is uh, disheartening when you've been like 10 years dry, like on the wagon, sober. And, uh, uh, and you have to read every year or so that you're loaded. So that's, that's disappointing because it's like a public notice that you're loaded, but you're not. So it's an obvious, you know, it's, uh, it's a disingenuous reportage, you know. But the important thing is you've come out of it. Yeah, I'm still alive, I'm still breathing. I mean, look, we can all get into sort of feeling, you know, sorry for ourselves or having a pity party about the past or what's happened. It's just not worth it because it affects the present and it affects the future. You can't sort of play into that sort of stuff. And there's nothing that can put you into the proper perspective. I mean, you can either be, you know, a bug living in the pile of elephant dung on the floor, or you can get up way high on the big top and look at the whole circus. And looking at the whole circus, looking at things in perspective is a much better idea. Rule number four, my personal favorite, push the boundaries. As an artist, you're supposed to do that. You're supposed to shove the boundaries. And you're supposed to do stuff that's out there. And you're supposed to do stuff that makes people uncomfortable, maybe. Mm. 
I mean, that's that's your job. There's the three E's. I forgot who said it first. Maybe I said it. I can't even <laughs> remember anymore. But it's you got to entertain. That's the first thing you got to do. And if you only do that, that's perfectly valid. If it's just for entertainment. If you can entertain and educate, that's better. And if you can entertain, educate, and elevate, mm. that's even better. I mean, if you could sort of raise people up in some kind of other way, a spiritual way maybe, you know, it's good. Rule number five, get feedback. I remember it was three hours and 15 minutes at one stage, and, and I had this great editor who I worked with again called Steve Rosenblum. And uh, Rosenblum and I were sitting there scratching our heads, figuring, how do we get a half hour out of this? And uh, we couldn't figure it out because we were so close to it. And it took a studio head to come in and give us a general note. That was Sherry Lansing. She gives us this general note. And we're like, we look at her and we look at each other and he said, what would she know? How did she get this job? You know, and 24 hours later, we're going, she's right. She's Ray's right. first studio in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but, the, but you know what? That simple note that she gave us enabled us to go from three hours 15 to two hours 48. And it just made the thing snap it's all along. The difference. Yeah, oh yeah, big deal. Rule number six is be a survivor. I think I, I always use the same word. I mean, they said, if you could sum up uh, Hollywood in one word, what would it be? And it's like, uh, I think I said survival. But um, if you could sum, you know, survivor, hey, I'm still breathing. Rule number seven, make it happen. Axel Ridge, is, that's an independent film. Uh, we didn't have scads of money. I mean, there's a lot of bang for your buck there. I think uh, um, so that like long rehearsals and you know this is, these are luxuries and they cost. Mm. So you know, I think we went in with a budget of 27 million U.S. on that, mm -hmm. which is hefty, but not half really, yeah. But but for what you get, right. you know, once you take it to Australia and you get you know the, the government helps you so with a rebate mm -hmm. and then you know dollar exchange and all that kind of stuff it. it it beefs it up a little more. You end up with more bang for your buck, maybe forty. Was it looser or tighter on Braveheart? It was. It was. Uh, we had more, more time money. and more money on that. Had and that was twenty years before. I think the budget on Braveheart, like twenty-two years ago, was more than the budget on mm -hmm. Hacksaw Ridge. It was almost twice as much. <laughs> and we had hundred and five shooting days on Braveheart, but on this we had fifty-nine shooting wow. days. So you, you know, you got to cut the cloth. Uh, you you know you got to make the suit to fit the the cadaver. You have to make things work, and you, and it, it really puts you on your metal to sort of like, okay, I need to get the best bang for my buck here. How do I do it? Even to the point where I went and bought two cameras myself, hmm. like little fifteen hundred dollar um, black magic digital cameras, and we were shoving them under rocks and up people's shirts, and you know everything. Rule number eight: Be a good storyteller. Any experience you have in life enriches your work somehow, mm. good or bad, I mm. think. So, you know, I developed a lot of things when I was had some time off. It was the off-season, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, I, I did a lot of stuff, and uh, it's just, you know, so good to be able to sort of come back and do what I love doing, just tell stories. That's all we all, we're all just storytellers, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've told stories to children. I ate stories. We need stories because when we're kicked into this planet, we're like this little stranger on the earth and we need to hear these things to reaffirm who we are in relation to our planet, our environs and everyone else. I thought it was so inspiring. I've never actually heard of anyone who was quite this. It was the pinnacle of heroism. I mean, it was like, wow. And he inspired me. And I couldn't be like that, I don't think. Not in a million years. But it gives us all hope, I think, that if we can see someone who behaves like an ordinary man in, in, in hideous circumstances doing extraordinary things, I think it, it, uh, it speaks to me, speaks to my soul, and hopefully to others. You know? So I think it's a story worth telling. If you're going to spend 18 months on something, it better be worthwhile. Rule number nine, create a great working environment. You know, I say stuff to the actors like Garfield or, mm -hmm. or Sam Worthington or Vince Vaughn, or, and I, I think, why? Maybe I shouldn't have said that because it, you know, you got to be careful. Mostly, I think a good director is the guy. If he has good people, he kind of leaves them alone, and if it's not broken, don't fix it. And it's mostly stuff like, yeah, do it a little faster, will you? Or, you know, maybe some other stuff. 
What is Mel Gibson like as a director? Oh, yeah, he's just so passionate and loving and nurturing and almost like a, like, you know, a good director is like a good mother and he's a really good mother, you know. <laughs> um, just a very like, gentle, compassionate, passionate. He's in the scene with you, really. He's there with you every moment. And really trusts his actors. Really trusts that that, that that you know where to go and how to how to get there. I've read he makes jokes on set. So oh yeah, no, he keeps it light when it needs to be. Yeah, he really does. Yeah, I think it's more for him than it is for anybody else. He has a kind of like nervous tick when when things get too serious. He'll he'll just kind of do some gallows gallows humor. And rule number ten, the last one before three very special bonus clips is have fun. On Halloween came around, we thought, well, let's go out for Halloween. So I bought some kind of goofy masks and uh, some gold change. There was no cohesiveness with the uh, stuff that we were wearing. But Mel had this exceptional mask that was done by a professional. Um, it looked like a real person, maybe Nick Nolte, but it looked like a real person. This close, you can't tell. This close, you can't. It's, you can't tell. I mean, it looks. Like it looks frightening. like a, it doesn't look like a mask. It looks like a. It looks like Nick Nolte is in the room scary. with you. It looks it, like a pissed wait, off wait, wait, lumberjack. Wait, wait, wait. Did the paparazzi pick up on this? Well, no. I think that's what he would Nick do. He, he could wear well, that, and they wouldn't know reputation. where he was. Huh? I said, I think that's what you could do. You could walk out of a hotel, and people would say maybe Nick Nolte's walking in a hotel, but they wouldn't know it was you. But we went uh, out on Halloween, and so we went out to like um, restaurants and stuff, and Mel was there with this mask that looks like a real human being, right? And we're kind of in these ghoul masks, whatever, but he has this on, and he'd be talking to somebody, they'd be having a conversation, and all of a sudden, but it didn't look like he had a mask on. It just looked like this was a real person. So then he would grab at his neck, and he would rip his face off as far as their perspective was, and you would see them go, oh my gosh, this isn't who I think I'm looking at, and then, oh my goodness, it's Mel Gibson underneath this. <laughs> And that would get uh, Alyssa quite a, a, a big response. And yeah. uh, that did not get old. We enjoyed that. That was a fun Halloween. This just kept going. A few happened. times, not too yeah. much, but a couple Do it times. a bunch. I'd like to see people's minds walk away. It's like, <laughs> funny. Mel, you that's had a amazing. funny story. I wish you we could like, reenact it right you now. You had a funny story, Mel, where you did it to a friend of yours who was like a stunt guy or something? Or? Oh, yeah. No, he was a, a friend of mine. He was a third Don Black Belt. I was talking to him one minute. He turned away. I put it on. Two seconds later, he turned back. He looked at me and it, he, he just went, Gah! and he punched me in the face. Like, really, he did really hard, too. I hit the deck, but I was laughing so hard, it was worth the hit. It was just like, it was the best reaction I've ever seen. Now I've got three very special Mel Gibson bonus clips on finding your gift, standing strong, and doing what fulfills you. But before that, my question of the day is, I wanna know, what was your favorite Mel Gibson movie of all time? Leave it down in the comments below. I'm really curious to find out. Thank you guys so much for watching. I believe in you. I hope you continue to believe in yourself and whatever your one word is. Much love, I'll see you soon, and enjoy the bonus clips. Just one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! Throughout his career, Mel's movie choices have been courageous. In 1995, he starred in the blockbuster Braveheart about Scottish national hero Sir William Wallace. He also directed the epic. It's a big jump to being a director, because I had this yearning to do it. I enjoyed it immensely. I get a, a, a kick out of uh, orchestrating the big stuff and having stuff play out or roll out the way I kind of visualize it. And um, I think um, I just I have a gift for the visual. I look at a character like Desmond, and it inspires the heck out of me because it, 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 he had a faith that I don't think I have. You know, so when you see somebody else who's able to really put their money where their mouth is, if you like, uh, about what faith is to them, and to really kind of crawl into the mouth of hell. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't believe that I could do that. But I certainly admire someone who can, and that's why that story I find so fascinating. And it's, but it's, isn't it striving? Isn't it the striving to do it, not being perfect? Well, yeah. <laughs> Basically saying, well, yeah, I'm going to try up. to get through this when everybody tells me I shouldn't? Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, you know, we're all going to have those moments. And it's being able to stand strong in that wind, you know. Well, you had that moment. You had that 10 years ago. 
Oh yeah, sure. This is a this was a big deal where yeah. after Apocalypto comes out, you get the DUI. Oh yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, but what? Yeah. How do you rise above it as you have? Well, you have to because it's like it's a it's a like a a tsunami of crap that hits you, you know, <laughs> all of a sudden. And you know, you okay? I'm ha I'm I'm on eight double tequilas in the back of a cop car having a nervous breakdown. You know, I said some stupid, <laughs> and it's like. You know, you wake up the next day and like, ah, and it's like, you know, you know, I made all the necessary mea culpas and all that sort of stuff. But 10 years is a long time to think about that. So you can't dwell on it. You got to just move ahead, do the work and get better. Was there a moment that it changed for you acting? Yeah, I think it, it was. I think when I started directing, I, I sort of found this whole other world that was mm. more fulfilling. And... Um, I ceased to be um, a mere component, and um, um, I felt like I was kind of like maybe it's just some kind of megalomaniac tendency of me. I, I don't know, but I, I just like the whole. I like being able to sort of be the you know the main storyteller. Raise your standard. Apple at the core, its core value is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. Not one drop of my self-worth depends on your acceptance of me. I don't ever give up. I'd have to be dead or completely incapacitated. Hey, Believe Nation, if you want to see my all-time favorite top 10 rules of success, I have a very special secret video for you. These are the individual clips that I have personally learned the most from and applied to my life and my business. Check the link in the description for details.